Good morning, Jonathan. You are live. Thanks so much, Rob. Uh, hi out there, everybody, and welcome to the uh, final session in our six part uh, solid wood bioheat webinar series. Uh, as you're probably familiar with by now, my name is Jonathan. Uh, I'll be the host uh, for the session today. Uh, and during the session, we're going to touch base with some bioheat leaders uh, who have contributed to successful biomass heating projects uh, in three distinct regions of Canada. Uh, so during the last webinar, uh, we heard from Nikki Manitowabi and Bob Thomas, uh, who shared some uh, biomass heating stories from Northern Ontario. Uh, equal parts uh, inspiring and interesting um, presentations on the Wickwam Kong uh, bioheat project and Lackwood pellets uh, demonstrated how bioheat can be successfully implemented to the benefit of households, uh, entire communities, uh, and the forest sector more broadly too. Um, so today's session is going to follow kind of a similar vein, uh, but instead of uh, staying in Ontario, uh, we're going to be taking a look at how bioheat technologies have been successfully implemented across Canada. Uh, as we'll become familiar with today, one of the biggest uh, uh, advantages of solid wood bioheat is the versatility of the applications, uh, buildings and regions that can benefit from this type of heat. Um, so. Uh, today's live session is a result of a partnership between four groups. Uh, the series that we're wrapping up today wouldn't have been possible without the support from the Centre for Research and Innovation in the Bioeconomy, also known as CRIBE, uh, FP Innovations, Natural Resources Canada, and the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry. Uh, on behalf of the webinar organizing team uh, putting together this series, I'd like to thank you for your interest and for joining us uh, throughout, especially today, our final session. Uh, for today's webinar, I'm honored to share our virtual podium with three expert speakers. Uh, first off, we'll hear from Rick Connors. He's a president and CEO of Gitsan Development Corporation based out west uh, in British Columbia. Uh, next, we'll travel just a little bit further north uh, to learn about the use of bioheat in the Northwest Territories. John Carr from the Arctic Energy Alliance uh, will be sharing some of his experiences with bioheat technology in Canada's northern regions. Uh, and last, but certainly not least, uh, our final presenter today will be Theo Lossier, who works as a development officer with BSB, a leading bioheat utility with operations in New Brunswick uh, and throughout the eastern seaboard. So on behalf of our webinar team uh, and the session audience, uh, I'd like to extend a warm welcome uh, to Rick, to John and to Theo. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, at the end of our speaker presentations today, we'll be holding a question and answer period. If you've tuned into any of our previous sessions, you'll be very familiar with the format. Uh, the Q&A portion for today's session uh, will be held over Slido, uh, and you can access that using your internet browser. Uh, so to access Slido, please type the website address displayed on the slide here uh, into your uh, URL bar. So that's www.sli.do. Uh, or you can access directly using uh, the link uh, that was sent to you uh, in an email earlier today. So once you're on the Slido website, you'll see a box to enter a participant code. Uh, for today's session, we're going to be using the code BIOHEAT M11, and that's to match today's date, which is March 11th. Uh, if you have any questions you'd like to ask our uh, session speakers, please send them over Slido. Other participants will be able to see your questions and can upvote uh, those questions by selecting a thumbs up icon uh, to advance the popular questions up to the top of the list. Please feel free to share your questions throughout the presentation. You will not have to wait uh, until the end to do so. Um, so hopefully you've been busy connecting over Slido uh, over the last minute or so while I've been speaking. Uh, and true to tradition, uh, once you make it onto the Slido forum, uh, you'll find a question there waiting for you. Uh, so the question we would like to ask to you today is where are you joining us from? Uh, it's always interesting to see where everybody uh, is joining the webinar session from. So I'll give you a minute just to fill out that response in our word cloud. Great, looking forward to seeing uh, where everybody's tuned in from. So uh, on that note, I think uh, I'll stop sharing my screen and I'll hand the, the virtual podium over to our first session speaker. Uh, so that's Rick Connors from Gitsun Development Corp, as I mentioned. So Rick, if you want to uh, get your presentation up and running, get your webcam, we're looking forward to hearing from you. Sounds good. Thank you very much, Jonathan. And welcome, everybody. Good morning or good afternoon. And uh, as Rob mentioned earlier in our conversations while we were preparing, uh, you can pretty much cover everything across Canada because we're represented today 
uh, from people uh, from coast to coast to coast. So uh, thank you very much for allowing us the opportunity to present today. And I'm going to speaking on uh, Hazelton bioheating projects. This is a development that um, we we took quite seriously some several years back now when we were looking at how do we um, how do we make a difference? How do we uh, take a look at what's going on in the bioeconomy? Uh, and in particular, because we're so wood centric and we're we're located way out in the middle, as a lot of people would uh, uh, like to think, we're out in the middle of nowhere. Um, however, you know, when you you put a pin in it, it's still the center of the earth because the the earth still revolves around it too, as well. So, as some of the other people that live up there uh, like to believe. Uh, so we're we're excited uh, because we've we've made a, a step in the right direction. We believe in terms of the reduction of GHGs, doing our part up north, and focusing on the actual uh, bioheating and bioenergy economy, uh, which has been which has been excellent for us uh, over the last little while. So I'm going to be speaking here on several installation sites that we've got developed. Uh, one, the Upper Skeena Recreation Centre, which is a brand new $23 million ice arena, along with a gymnasium, uh, weight room, uh, conference centre and uh, and food court. Uh, that's all in, in that one very uh, substantive centre. The Gixan Wet'suwet'en Education Society, it's a college uh, up in Hazelton as well. Get Max Gas Bar. It's a restaurant as well as a car wash that's attached to that uh, building too as well. Uh, attached to not physically, but uh, within 100, 100 feet of it. So there's a, a, an interlink between the two. Uh, the Gixan Development Corporation, our new corporate office, a 10,000 square foot office building there. And also Gixan Forest Inc., which is a three bay commercial garage building. Uh, 40 by 60 foot building, 30 feet high. It's uh, a substantial, a substantial uh, building that we use to maintain and, and fix uh, vehicles and such inside. Our our uh, installations were supported uh, in in large by Enercan, Natural Resources Canada, through the CERC funding, made uh, several of these sites possible, um, and that's the impetus uh, behind BioHeat that has been really needed. Uh, and and uh, much sought after by a lot of the remote communities because it's uh, it's not easy to start something new in particular when you have a country like Canada that has the largest battery in the world in in our forest resources and um, we uh, seem to uh, bypass the the obvious thing and that is in rem rural and remote communities to uh, supplement our heating. Uh, with the the bioheat uh, supply of fuel uh, to burn that uh, to produce heat, um, and the addition supported by the community, a community plan that was uh, established some years back, and they recognized this, and it was actually part of the community plan for the entire area, and support supported by a, a local uh, bioheat. Uh, uh, supplier of, of uh, froling bioheat uh, appliances and whether or not it's froling or any other supplier of, of bioheat there it's a big market and uh, we just found that uh, we had to make a choice and we had to get in there and, and commit to the the projects so the first project here being the upper Skeena recreation center it's a, it's an arena gymnasium has meeting rooms and a confectionery as well it's an all wood building uh, which was uh, highly sought after up, up north there. We experienced some significant delays here because of course we were, de we were dealing with um, a lot of the major contractors and, and this was the first building of its type uh, up north. And they had a lot of significant uh, issues in terms of there's some mold, some moisture problems there and, and uh, because it's so remote, uh, getting equipment in and out, uh, so significant delays sought in the uh, uh, that were experienced throughout the entire project. Multiple stakeholders dealing with several different people that, or different stakeholders that wanted to have different things done at different times. Our target there to reduce GHG's uh, projection of about 320 tons uh, per annum. We installed two T4 150 kilowatt boilers for a total load of 300 kilowatts. And the boilers themselves uh, are, can handle both wood chips and pellets. And we're we're scheduling start up here. We're still waiting for the the interconnection um, uh, to uh, that that system has not been started up as yet. This is a this is the actual uh, building. 
that uh, that would supply the heat. They're the two T4s, as you can see in the uh, right hand slide, uh, are installed inside that building in those two uh, gray larger uh, buildings there are actually the, the pellet silos or wood chip silos because they can accept both. And you can see the accept, accepting ducts on the top of the buildings. Those were Warwick structures, prefabricated structures that we had um, uh, brought there and then put up and they're welded in place. And, and we floated that on, on pilings and a, a, a steel engineered floor. So it was uh, uh, a very uh, uh, a simple installation from the perspective that everything shows up and then you can populate the building. We initially wanted this to be a student and community led uh, uh, building that we were going to put up, uh, but the delays just took that right off the rails and we had to go with a, a commercial uh, install of a, 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 a steel building. The second building was the Gixan with Soton Education Society. It's a college and it was a retrofit fit of an old building. As you can see, uh, this is us installing or putting the uh, the boiler in one of the boilers into the building itself. We had to actually cut a hole out of the side of the building um, and we took up an old uh, an old room where we found there was asbestos and, and a number of other things that uh, we uncovered. Uh, we had to do some remediation there, so there was uh, some complications. Uh, it was it was much easier from a stakeholder perspective because we we had the one one client, and uh, we were basically making sure that they were happy with what was going on. Uh, we had skilled labor available at the time because we had already done uh, another installation and uh, we were using the same people, which was great because then you get that efficiency of duplication. Targeting approximately a 300 ton uh, GHG reduction and again two T4 150 kilowatt boilers there that would accept both wood chips and pellets with startup that was con was uh, occurred in 2020. The the uh, hole in the wall that you saw there in the previous slide that was covered by the actual pellet silo which is uh, to the right here. And that's a that's a pellet and wood chip silo with the accepts uh, bin you can see or the port just on the top of that door. Uh, and inside there's two of the T4 150 kilowatt rolling boilers. The third installation was at the Gitmax gas bar and car wash where we uh, installed the boilers inside a prefabricated new building. It was in the, the third bay, the far right bay of the uh, that uh, the car wash building itself. Uh, we did experience significant delays there too as well, just simply because of weather. They were uh, attempting to put the building up in the in the middle of winter and that was one of the winters where um, we got uh, six feet of snow in the in the month of month of uh, February, so it, it didn't really uh, uh, it wasn't too conducive to uh, getting much done outside. Uh, again, a single stakeholder skilled labor labor that was available and a projection of about 150 tons in GHG reductions there. In this one here, particular installation, uh, we did not facilitate wood chips. It was just simply uh, pellet boilers, so two. 100 kilowatt P4 uh, froling boilers and startup was uh, uh, initiated in uh, 2020, early 2020. This is a look inside. This is pre -ins insulated. Uh, puts got some of the earlier pictures in here because it's it's hard to see once you put all the white ins insulation on top of that in terms of the, uh, the complexity mixing valves. Uh, we've got two different sites that it was being serviced. You've got two 400 gallon hot water storage tanks, which are eventually wrapped and insulated. Um, but those are the two boilers and that uh, supply the heat and the back wall. It's very hard to to uh, discern this, but um, the very back wall there, that's a uh, about a 14 ton pellet silo that uh, is accessed from the back of that car wash building for storage of pellets. This is the Gixan Development Corporation, the new office. It was a new build. Um, we did have significant delays there too, primarily because of COVID. Uh, there was uh, a period there where all the contractors, we were just in the heat of it, right literally uh, March of last year and uh, hoping to uh, uh, to get wrapped up. 
but we had to uh, send all the contractors home because of the number of, of contractors and proximity and the safety precautions. So all of a sudden we uh, we took a basically a whole year delay as we brought in one contractor after another uh, and, and couldn't have them all mixing at the same time because of the closed spaces. Um, a little bit of unscheduled uh, delays there. We're targeting about 110 tons of GHG reduction. And for that 10,000 square foot building, we've, we've got a T4 150 kilowatt boiler that will accept both wood chips and pellets. And you can see in the bottom picture, the um, there's a uh, three small windows in the top left of the building. And right underneath that, that attachment is actually the wood chip and pellet silo with a hydraulic lift door on the top of that, that uh, we we utilize to port the uh, the pellets and or wood chips into the uh, the boiler storage or the fuel storage area. This is inside, and I I included a picture of the before and after, um, so you can see the differentiation there between a um, just a piped in uh, boiler system and then the uh, finished or completed. Uh, insulated uh, system where you've got your uh, the white uh, insulation on all the uh, supply and return lines internal to the uh, the office building itself. In the Gixan Four Sink, the garage, it's a retrofit of a, a quite an old uh, garage building. You can see the actual stack coming out the side of the uh, the building there in the left. Um, we include domestic hot water in this particular case here. Uh, and it, it, the reduction, not although still significant, there are only 35 tons of GHG reduction. Uh, the most of the loss is, is due to the fact that you, when you open and close those doors, you you just simply uh, you, you flush all the good warm air out of the the actual building itself. And it was designed with a 38, uh, 32, 38 kilowatt uh, pellet boiler, uh, and utilizing uh, radiators in the offices, office space up up top. Uh, but also two uh, Rainer uh, hot air blowers and that startup was in uh, 2018 and uh, has been very efficient and and a uh, long term utilization. So some key points and lessons learned in uh, our installation there. Uh, avoid winter civil work if possible. Uh, do not over engineer the project and, and I, I say that because uh, we were making biomass much more complicated than it needs to be. When when you look at all the installations uh, over in Europe, they keep it very simple. And training is is absolutely key. You need to get the community and the people immersed into the bioheat world as soon as possible, uh, because what you what you'll find if you're supplying with wood chips, wood chips are not the same. Uh, depending on your uh, where you're getting them from. You've had other presentations in the seminar about that, the fuel supply. It's a key part of the entire uh, success of your, your install. Timely ordering of long lead time equipment. If you're in a remote area, uh, make sure you order uh, enough uh, equipment so that you're, you're in supplies, uh, piping and tubing and elbows and, and, and joints and things like that where you can experience delays, uh, several hours delay if you're missing one coupling and uh, you didn't get enough in there. It's easier to bring stuff back and, and re repopulate than it is to go and get it when you're long distance from a supply outlet. Attention to the mechanical room layout for serviceability in the long term basis so that you can maintain these boilers and don't cramp them. Give them ample room to, uh, to maneuver. Ensure all your equipment is certifiable. To Canadian standards, CSA and ASME where, where and if required. Engage the community early. Newsletter we found was very good. We highlighted the fact that we're bringing in a GHG reduction um, uh, aspect of, of a project and as well we are creating community engagement uh, through creation of jobs because we needed fiber to come in, we needed maintenance of the boilers and as well on a long term uh, there might even be some harvest involved in, in when switching from pellets to wood chips. So it was uh, it was a very good way to get the community engaged. Identify a community champion so that you have got ownership of the project because as a supplier, when you're away, you need to have somebody advocating and making sure that things are still working well and that communication is is key there that it may, it's maintained throughout the entire time. 
and train more than one individual. Um, what we found was that uh, people like to move on and uh, and so you needed to make sure that there was engagement at, at all levels there so that people knew exactly what was happening inside that boiler room. Although it's a simple process, it is something that um, is, is very complicated from a long-term perspective and you want to educate them. Hiring local labor, machine operators, contractors, making sure uh, experience is part of your equation, their experience uh, is, is, is important. But if you've got experienced people that are teaching them, their learning, their training is going to be much more uh, valuable and, and comprehensive to you in the long term. A reputable engineering partner, don't, don't over-engineer the, the job, keep it simple. We're, we're simply burning biomass and, and I, as I always like to say that that's, uh, it's five times more efficient than, than burning of, of diesel uh, to create heat that way. So it, keep that in your head at all times. On reserve deliveries, save the PST, plan your deliveries so that you're on reserve if you're dealing with First Nations and, and uh, it's a money savings way of, of uh, operating your project. Know where you live and assess limitations, deliveries, services, accommodations, availability of last minute acquisitions, all those parameters that will cause you significant delays if you don't take them into consideration. The last three points here, uh, study your fuel supply logistics. Uh, fuel supply is key to the ongoing success of your project. Understand where your fuels are coming from and your costs. Understand the limitations of your fuel supply quality and the effect that it has, the impact that it'll have on your operation and on your site and on the mindset of your people. Because if they're always encountering problems due to poor fuel quality, then that's going to reflect on poor operations of your, your plant. Last but not least, I've said it a couple times already, but train the people. Train the people to, to be the community partners. Train the people to take ownership because it's theirs. It's their system. They need to be able to rely upon it. Thank you very much and happy to take questions later on or call me at any time. Appreciate the invite. Awesome. Thank you so much, Rick, for that presentation. It was fantastic to check in on some of the installs that have been going on uh, up in northern BC. Uh, fantastic lessons that you've shared with everybody on the webinar session. So I think everybody will probably love to see a copy of that uh, presentation deck afterwards, uh, be able to learn from some of the successes that you guys have had uh, out west. Thank you, Jonathan. Great. Uh, so I guess moving on to the next part uh, of our panel discussion today, I'm going to invite John Carr to step up to uh, the virtual podium, uh, flip on your webcam and maybe uh, share your presentation screen so that we can uh, hear what you have to say. OK, thanks, Jonathan. Um, can you hear me and can you see the presentation? I sure can. Excellent. Well, thanks very much uh, again for the opportunity to uh, join you here today and, and tell you uh, some of the story of, of our uh, development of biomass heating in the uh, the NWT. And first of all, I just want to say uh, thanks for the uh, great presentation, Rick, and, and those lessons learned. Uh, I would echo all of them, and so I don't have to uh, to cover those because uh, they were they were so well, well covered by Rick. Uh, so uh, what I'm going to do is just tell you a bit of the story of, of the development of, of biomass heating in the NWT. It's, it's got about a 15 year history now, maybe a bit more. Um, and as I was going through the, uh, the material, I realized that I could talk about this all day. So I'm going to uh, struggle to keep myself to, uh, to 20 minutes here. Uh, so first of all, Arctic Energy Alliance, we're a, a nonprofit organization, non-government organization, and our mission is to uh, promote and facilitate the adoption of efficient and renewable energy practices by all members of NWT society. And uh, we've been around for uh, more than 20 years now. We have uh, five regional offices uh, outside of our, uh, our Yellowknife uh, main office. So the NWT uh, consists of about 33 communities and we're spread over a, a very wide area. So there's a lot of different uh, conditions uh, in the different communities. Um, two thirds of our population lives in eight of the communities that have hydroelectricity and the other one third of the population is spread over the other 25 communities that have um, mostly uh, diesel generated electricity uh, as well as uh, uh, some uh, natural gas. So uh, first of all, the uh, the economic picture of energy in NWT is, is perhaps a little different than, than most people are used to. 
unless they uh, they live in a remote community. So this is the uh, the cost uh, of different types of energy for space heating um, in dollars per gigajoule. So typically we see a lot of uh, oil uh, heating, uh, mid efficiency furnaces and, and boilers. Uh, you know, roughly delivering heat at twenty eight dollars a gigajoule. Uh, electricity, the residential electricity rate would be about $86 a gigajoule and commercial electricity would be about $67 a gigajoule. And that's in Yellowknife with uh, with hydroelectricity. So you see, this is, this is why we don't do much uh, electric heating here. Even uh, heat pumps struggle to be economical with, with those electricity costs. So taking electricity out, uh, again, you can see the, the typical oil. Uh, most of the, the newer stuff is uh, high efficiency condensing propane because it's it's a lot more economical than the oil. But if you look over to the right, you see uh, wood pallets by the bag, uh, wood pallets bulk delivery, and wood pallets wholesale bulk delivery. So biomass is is really the uh, the cheapest heating option. Unfortunately, cordwood, the market price of cordwood uh, sort of prices it out a little bit. But if you're harvesting yourself, then it's uh, essentially free. This is uh, another community for Providence, so it's it's off the hydroelectric uh, grid. So you see the electricity price now. The residential subsidized electricity is the same price as Yellowknife, but the unsubsidized rate, if you go above the subsidy threshold, is about $192 a gigajoule, and the commercial uh, electricity rate is about $186 a gigajoule. So again, no electric heating. Uh, even in uh, uh, what a smaller uh, community, the uh, the prices are, are similar, uh, and again, wood pellets uh, in bulk. And especially wood pellets in, in wholesale bulk uh, really provide the, the cheapest heating option. And so that's that's I think what's driving most of the development of biomass in the NWT. I'd like to say it's because people are concerned about reducing the greenhouse gas emissions, and I'm sure that's part of it, but the economics uh, are really underlie the whole thing. So where did it all start? Uh, around maybe 2004, 2005, uh, this fellow Bruce Elliott, uh, kind of the, the visionary of wood pellets, he started talking about wood pellets and and uh, most people weren't that familiar with it, and, and I think a lot of people were pretty skeptical. Um, but uh, he really, he was a, a successful businessman, and he put his uh, his money where his mouth was, and uh, started a business called Arctic Green Energy because he saw the opportunity for uh, for biomass uh, uh, heating. Most of the pellets in the NWT uh, are coming from uh, just south of our border with Alberta. There's a place called La Crete. They have a sawmill. And uh, as I understand it, when a log goes into a sawmill, about half the log becomes lumber and the other half becomes waste, uh, shavings and, and sawdust. And it used to be they just destroyed that waste uh, to get rid of it. It was, uh, it was just a nuisance. But they realized they could uh, th run it through a pellet mill, turn it into something that had value and help us uh, get off of our dependence on fossil fuels. So the first big commercial boiler in the NWT that really started it all was at the North Slave Correctional Center. And this was, uh, again, the, the Bruce Elliott that I mentioned who started Arctic Green Energy. He, he decided that he could um, buy the boiler, install the boiler, operate the boiler, and sell heat, and sell heat at a discount to the market price of, of the heating oil. And so, so that's what he did. So this uh, this boiler is is owned and operated, or was owned and operated by Arctic Green Energy. Unfortunately, they're they're no longer in business. But um, um, the GNWT, which operates the North Slave Correctional Center, buys the heat at a discount from the the market price of oil. And that uh, that really um, kind of proved the technology. I mean, people who were skeptical about it, uh, you know, Bruce put his money where his mouth was and and showed that it worked. Uh, I'm gonna. Uh, talk a little bit about supply and distribution because I think this is, is really important to understand the, the development uh, of the industry and it's, it's kind of a chicken and egg thing you know do you, do you put the boilers in first and then let the supply and distribution develop or do you develop a, a supply and distribution network and, and then you'll have uh, uh, boilers but um, they both really have to develop in tandem so the uh, the first pellet delivery truck we saw in, in was in Yellowknife uh, again Arctic Green Energy um, around about 2008 and then they upgraded that truck. Uh, this uh, the first truck was an auger uh, delivery. This is a pneumatic delivery system and a little larger, and it can weigh the volumes uh, on the deliveries. And then once the uh, the market had been a little more established, uh, there's actually another company that uh, started delivering pellets as well. So this is the uh, uh, the third delivery truck, but the the second business that's delivering pellets and it's, it's enterprise pellets, not to be confused with the community of enterprise where there there may be a pellet mill developing in the future. This is uh, uh, just a pellet uh, distribution business called Enterprise Pellets. The, uh, as the distribution uh, spread outside of, of Yellowknife, there was uh, 
a, a distribution uh, network developed in the South Slave, starting in Hay River. The Taylor and Company bought this distribution, uh, this, this uh, truck, and they can make deliveries um, in Hay River and uh, Fort Smith and Fort Resolution, uh, Fort Simpson, uh, Fort Providence. So really, really cover the, uh, the South Slave uh, uh, road network communities. Um, so that allowed, again, those, those communities to take advantage of that as, a, as an eating option. Uh, more recently, um, this is about uh, four or five years ago, in Norman Wells, um, a company called Green Energy NWT started up. Now, Norman Wells is not on the road system, so they have to bring in the, uh, the annual uh, pellet demand um, and store it, um, either on the winter road, the ice road that's in for a short time, or on the, in the summer on the barge. So you see they have a large uh, pellet storage area. Uh, to hold the annual uh, needs for the community. For those that uh, that can can um, purchase at, at an, a scale, um, they can get wholesale pellet delivery, uh, which is direct from the mill. So Lacrete Sawmills actually owns their own trucks. These you can see the logo on the side there is Lacrete. They uh, you can call up the the pellet mill and say I want a, a truckload of pellets. It's a B train. It's about 40, 42 tons, and they will deliver it directly to your boiler. So it's it's uh, quite a bit cheaper when you do it that way, but then you have to take um, a, a load at a time, which is the equivalent of about 20,000 liters of heating oil. So um, larger systems are able to take advantage of, of that option. So I'm going to go through uh, some of the uh, biomass boilers that we, we've seen develop over the territory. So this is one of the first ones uh, in Yellowknife after the North Slave Correctional Center, uh, a private company uh, at the time called Northern Properties, um, now called Northview. Uh, who owns uh, quite a number of apartment buildings in the north. Uh, they decided that, that it, it might hold some promise for them to reduce their, their operating costs. And so this was the, the first boiler that they put in at a place called Bison Apartments. And you can see um, it's just two stacked sea cans. So the bottom sea can uh, contains the boiler and the top sea can actually contains the pellets. They even bought their own uh, truck. This is their own private distribution truck that they use to, to fill their own boilers. Uh, you see they're putting the pellets in the, the top sea can there. So it's uh, it's functional, but um, you know not particularly aesthetic. Uh, one of the next boilers to go in was another uh, boiler where Arctic Green Energy purchased and operated the boiler and sold heat, and it was at uh, Sir John Franco School, which is the high school where I went. And um, that I think uh, by this time people were realizing that that there was uh, there was really something to this pellet. People were skeptical at first and thought it might not work. They realized it was working. They realized Bruce was making money at it. So. Um, I think there, there was after that, there wasn't a lot of people who wanted to go the, the heat uh, purchase agreement. Um, generally, people were purchasing and installing their own boilers and, and realizing all the savings themselves. Uh, and one of those was the, uh, the city of Yellowknife. Uh, so the city of Yellowknife did a community energy plan and uh, set a target for reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And they realized that by putting this uh, biomass boiler, uh, at the uh, the pool, the arena, and the curling club, it's a district heat system, and they could uh, just about meet their, their greenhouse gas reduction target for the community um, in the community energy plan with this this one boiler. It was uh, it was so significant. I think it's a uh, 740 kilowatt boiler. Uh, we actually installed a, a, a biomass boiler at our office here in Yellowknife. Um, so this is a, a 30 kilowatt Woodmaster. And we decided to um, try and demonstrate something that could burn both cordwood and wood pellets. So this is an energy cabin. There's a pellet storage on half the cabin and the other half is the boiler. And the boiler can also be manually fed with cordwood, which we've, we've done a few times, but um, generally we, we let it run on pellets because the, uh, uh, the amount of labor that's required to, to load the boiler. This is uh, actually one more of the, um, the heat sale agreement. This is a um, uh, an Oakstruck housing co-op, which is a housing cooperative in Yellowknife. And again, Arctic Green Energy uh, purchased the boiler, installed the boiler, operates the boiler, and sells heat to the housing co-op at a reduced price. And this one, you can see the, uh, the, the, the silo is a little different. I think this is one of the uh, a fiberglass silo that, uh, that was manufactured here in Yellowknife rather than a steel or a grain silo, which is, is more common. This was one of the uh, the first uh, buildings, uh, the Chief Draggies Hall in uh, in Deda, uh, uh, built by the uh, the Yellowknife Dene First Nation. Uh, one of the first buildings to actually incorporate biomass into the building. 
So as this, this building was being built, they, they built the biomass boilers right in. And these are uh, three of the, uh, the original uh, main energy systems boilers. Um, these, these are no longer available now. They, they use the, the UCFEN. But um, the, again, the fiberglass uh, silo uh, nestled in behind the building so it doesn't uh, obstruct the, the view. And um, so again, that was one of the first ones where the boilers were built into the building. And since then, there, there has been a change in the fire marshal and the way the fire marshal is approaching uh, biomass boilers uh, probably means that we won't see too many where the boilers are built into the building anymore because of, of uh, fire ratings and, and, uh, and requirements uh, that the fire marshal has imposed. But at the time, uh, it was something we were able to do. So this is uh, St. Joseph's School, also in Yellowknife. Uh, again, the GNWT had a couple of those uh, heat purchase agreements, and then they realized that uh, you know they could install it and operate it themselves and, and realize all of the savings rather than splitting the savings with the, uh, the private company. So, so this is uh, one of the first boilers that the GNWT uh, purchased and installed. And just to demonstrate their commitment to the technology, uh, they installed uh, a wood pellet boiler at the NWT uh, Legislative Assembly building in, uh, this was in 2010, and it's a uh, 300 kilowatt boiler. Uh, as I mentioned, um, Northview at the time Northern Properties had installed that, that uh, boiler at Bison and uh, realized that it was saving them all kinds of money and they decided to, to uh, expand. So they installed uh, this system, which heats uh, three of their apartment buildings in a district heat system. And you can see that uh, now they, they've started putting some siding on the sea cans and, and a little roof as well. So it, it looks a little nicer than the, the bare sea can that was the first one. Uh, here's another one that they installed. Uh, again, three apartment buildings. Um, and again, sided to make it look a little bit nicer. And another one at uh, Garden Townhomes. So the uh, the GNWT uh, at this point had had um, really had realized the uh, the, the value that uh, wood pellets brought and had uh, started making a, a, you know, effort to to install more boilers wherever they they made sense. And so this is one they installed at the Combined Services Building uh, in Yellowknife at the airport. And what I wanted to highlight about this one is uh, some of the early boilers were um, were binders and they, they had a bit of a higher maintenance requirement. And that's something people have to understand when they're when they're heating with biomasses, there's a, a pretty substantial maintenance requirement. But uh, these boilers have automated ash removal and um, as well as a cyclone on the on the exhaust that uh, pulls the fly ash out to reduce the emissions. And um, and that's again, nice and easy to, to uh, empty and you don't have to do it very often. So it really reduces the maintenance uh, component, which is, is really nice. Uh, this is pretty unique, I think, um, in the NWT and possibly in, in Canada and maybe North America. This is a, uh, I don't have a picture of the, of the inside, I couldn't find that, but it's a 650 kilowatt Woodmaster boiler built into this new office building as it was being built. Again, I think with the new regulations from the fire marshal, you, you have a hard time doing that, but at the time it was possible. So the, uh, the, the boiler is in this new building and it also heats the, the two adjacent buildings. So it's a district heating system that heats three office towers in, in downtown Yellowknife from uh, in the basement of, of this building. Uh, the Prince of Wales Northern Heritage Center, which is our, our museum here in Yellowknife. Uh, this is the uh, uh, an, a private uh, business owner that owns the uh, Anderson Thompson Tower Apartments and they installed uh, a biomass boiler. And you can see when they have the, the silo with the large auger, this is so that they can get the, uh, the B train deliveries. So, so anytime you see that, that large auger going up to the top of a silo, it means that they're getting the wholesale bulk direct from the mill, which is the, uh, the, the cheaper uh, option. Uh, so the city of Yellowknife installed that first boiler uh, back in about 2008. And uh, in about 2018, they, they realized uh, how good it was and they installed another one. And this one heats the, um, uh, the field house and the multiplex and the fire hall and a Department of Transportation uh, a garage as well. And this one actually won the City of Yellowknife a Sustainable Community Award. Uh, this is uh, another GNWT installation in Edzo, uh, which is in Betchacol, and it's at the at a school there. This is a uh, district heating system in Hay River, the GNWT installed. It's a, um, I believe it's a, a one megawatt boiler and it heats four schools. These uh, four schools and the uh, the district heat pipe runs uh, a total of about uh, 500 meters from the uh, from the boiler to the, the furthest school. And that was in about uh, 2010, and this was one of the anchor um, um, installations that allowed the development of the, the distribution infrastructure uh, in the South Lake region. This is a, a district heating system in Betchico, and this one is, is interesting. It's owned by the, the Tlicho Investment Corp, and they heat seven buildings. 
And um, several of those buildings are, are heat sale agreements. So there's, they're essentially a heat utility, as well as heating their own buildings, they're selling heat to, uh, to nearby buildings. This is at the uh, Betchico Water Treatment Plant. So this is owned by the community government of Betchico, uh, heating the, uh, the water uh, treatment plant. And it's kind of an innovative pellet storage. You see here, it's, it's not the, um, the tall silo with the, uh, uh, the auger for the, the, big, the bulk delivery. Um, so they're getting smaller deliveries and pneumatic delivery, but they've taken a C can, turned it on edge, and and converted it into a a, a pellet storage tank, I guess. Uh, this boiler is owned by the uh, community government of Wati. It's a district heating system, and again, uh, they're heating three of their own buildings, but they're also selling heat uh, to the the GNWT Health Center. So they're they're a heat sale utility, and um, I always like the the picture in the winter with the uh, uh, steam coming out of the top. There shows that it's working. Uh, Fort McPherson. Uh, this one is owned by the uh, Tetlip Gritchen, and it is uh, again a heat sale agreement. They heat their own building, and they also sell heat to the GNWT at the health center next door as a heat sale utility. This is a community called Kakiza, and this is a, a small uh, energy cabin that heats their uh, their community government office as well as the hotel next door. And they wanted to go with something that could also burn cordwood. And so uh, this is um, uh, during a training. I think um, uh, Rick mentioned the, the importance of training and, and more than one person, several people. So they're doing a, a bit of a, a training on, on how to operate and maintain the boiler here. Um, I think after they, they had operated for a little while on cordwood, they realized that the, the amount of time and effort that was required to load the boiler uh, was something they, they, they weren't uh, as interested in. So they, they switched to pellets and the boiler actually is able to use pellets. There's a pellet storage uh, area in the back half of the building and it can get um, bulk deliveries uh, through this top hatch. Uh, this is, I think, the only steam biomass boiler in the NWT. Uh, it's at the Fort Simpson uh, uh, Central Steam Plant, and um, it was a, a, an existing district heating system, a district heating uh, steam system, but they, uh, they added this uh, biomass boiler to it in order to um, reduce the, the heating costs, and it's a uh, 980 kilowatt boiler. Uh, Norman Wells, uh, again, the, uh, the, the, with the um, uh, company going into the, the business of distribution that allowed people to install the boilers. So here's uh, at uh, the MRE Inn. Now this, this one is a little different. Some of the, a lot of the other ones have been a single large boiler. This is using the, the MES boilers and these are uh, four uh, 56 kilowatt MES boilers uh, staged in a, uh, in a single uh, sea can. Um, this is up in Anuvik, uh, same thing. Um, the, um, the use of the MES boilers, uh, multiple boilers in a, in a single uh, boiler plant. And this one has been you know, sided, nice wood siding to make it look a little nicer and nestled in the back of the apartment building there. And another one in Anubrick, uh, this is again, two of the um, MES boilers in a, in a seat can outside the building. So the, uh, the, the GNWT, as I said, was, was really key to, uh, to developing the, uh, the distribution uh, and supply of pellets in, in a lot of the communities outside of Yellowknife. And this is the, uh, all of the boilers that the GNWT has installed to date, um, you know, starting back with the North Slave Correctional Center. And the most recent one uh, was last year. They put a, a, a two and a half megawatt uh, uh, heating plant on the new hospital that, that was just built here in Yellowknife. Uh, and this I, I stole from Beesman. It just shows uh, some of the, uh, the locations of their boilers uh, spread throughout the territory. And so since 2006, when this all started, uh, we've had approximately 100 uh, commercial institutional biomass heating systems in 15 communities. And we've got a, a total installed capacity now of, of roughly uh, uh, 28 megawatts. And I think our, our total pellet demand in the territory now is around 25 to 30,000 tons per year, uh, which is the equivalent of something like 12 to 15 million liters of heating oil and, and the equivalent of about uh, 35 to 40,000 tons of, of greenhouse gas uh, uh, reduction per year. So that's uh, all I had to say. I, I think I did manage to keep it to 20 minutes. So thank you very much. Back to you. Yeah, thanks so much, John. Very interesting to see kind of the, the rollout of all of those different systems, uh, despite the fact that, you know, NWT doesn't have any domestic pellet production itself. So uh, really speaks, I guess, to the importance of having that kind of economic situation uh, to drive the uptake of those systems. Uh, and of course, the GHG benefits are, are a nice add on to that as well, too. So thanks so much for your presentation. Really appreciated that. Interesting to see uh, all of the different buildings. 
Um, so I guess moving on then uh, to our final speaker uh, in the panel today, I'm going to welcome uh, Theo to flip on his uh, webcam uh, and get his presentation all shared. Uh, and we're going to move uh, out to the East Coast to hear about some installs uh, over uh, in Eastern Canada. Perfect. All right, thanks. Uh, thanks, Theo. Looking welcome. forward to hearing. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Thanks uh, for giving us the opportunity to uh, have us today. So we'll start uh, closely because we have lots of picture to show you. First of all, the BSB uh, Biomass Solution Biomass established in 2011. We're a leader uh, provider of uh, heating equipment and we are official distributor of uh, Macy's, which is Okofen, Hertz, or Hars, I should say, Binder, and Marbury product. Our shareholders are Jean-Claude Savoie, who owns Group Savoie, and Malcolm Fisher, which is from Sackville, New Brunswick, owns Compact Appliances and Norkey's Distribution. This is a picture of the Compaq. Uh, Compaq Appliances uh, was founded in uh, over 30 years ago, and it covers all the Atlantic uh, provinces, primarily an alternative uh, heating solution. Norkeys, which is uh, established in 2011, which is also owned by Malcolm, supplying quality fire power plays, insert, wood stove, pallet stove, and many other accessories in Northeast states. A picture of uh, Group Savoie's installation in Saint-Quentin, found in uh, 1978, is a leading leader producer of a wide range of hardwood product, including pallets, cabinet and furniture components, ecologic uh, fuel blocks, and many more variety of hardwood product. This is a picture of the Group Savoie wood pellet plant, which uh, produced about 90,000 metric tons a year. And in using uh, our product raw material, byproduct raw material. Delivery truck. This is our delivery truck. Uh, we, we say that it's the first specialized truck in delivery because uh, as you can see, uh, you see the scales. So we had to have uh, Transport Canada to come and calibrate the scales. So actually the uh, tank is lift and put on the scales and then uh, you got a printer uh, to come up uh, and give you the size of uh, the delivery that you have, either three tons to four tons or whatever. Actually, uh, as you can see, the difference also in the uh, picture is we have two sets of uh, hoses, which one is to supply the pellets and the other one is to recover all the dust. So actually, I'm going to go back I can just show you the vacuum system that we have on the this truck. So it really sucks all the dust and the turbulence that you can have when you deliver inside a, a silo and it bring back that to the mill. This is the silo, uh, typical silo and residential in my place. Kind of fancy because I put some wheels on it so I can move it. That's a, a silo that can contain about 3.5 ton, and uh, it goes in the basement, seven six high by uh, six by six inches wide. This is a typical small installation, as you can see on the left hand side, the border, and uh, with the vacuum system, which is a simple. Uh, Macy's or Oco fence system, and then you got the pellets on the right hand side. So I'll give you some example. Uh, we 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 installed uh, in Saint Quentin the church. 
they were uh, actually having 296 kilowatt boilers burning about uh, 32,000 liters per year. So in November uh, 2013, we installed two Okafen boilers with uh, two buffer tanks and a nine ton silo with a vacuum system, of course, which is Okafen. So at the time, we uh, intend to have an estimated saving of about $24,000 a year, minus the peak demand of using oil for 7,000. So we figure that the uh, yearly saving will be about 17,000 and the payback will be 5.5. So the end result is that in 2011, you see the figures, the heat fuel system, 11, 12, 30,000, 12, 13, 26. Now in 12, 13, or I should put 12, 13, 14, the pellet fuel cost was 10,656. So if you compare that on the heating savings, actually the payback period was 4.5 years at the church. And in 2018, the New Brunswick carbon tax came on, the federal and everything. So if you figure that we at least eliminate these 87.5 ton and every year, so that's an additional saving of 5250. If, of course, you take the carbon tax into consideration. Picture of an installation, it's a two oak fan on the left hand side and the two buffer tank on the right hand side. You got more picture here on the left hand side. You see the old fuel boilers and then you see the uh, installation inside of the vacuum system and the uh, nine ton uh, pellet storage. We had a similar installation done uh, at the town hall in Saint Quentin in 2014. Uh, so it's the same typical installation almost, and the total cost uh, for the pellets was uh, 45 tons, which is $10,000. $10, total saving was 15 in 14-15. Return on investment was 6.5. In 2015, they had an additional maintenance building, which is was 50 by 85. And uh, since that addition uh, maintenance building to the uh, heating system, they still are saving $7,000 a year. The replacement of the oil consumption re reduced the emission of the CO2 by 61.3 ton, which another additional 1226. Installation of the Ocofen. That's a broad picture on the back of the borders and the two uh, buffer tank on the right hand side. Uh, let's move a bit to uh, more commercial, industrial, and biomass border. This is a typical binder. About uh, binder start at about 300 kilowatts and go to megawatts. So. As you know, you got the uh, electric igniters, anti back burners, you got your walking floor, and you got your ash going at the bottom, and uh, you can have a automatic uh, ash design. So, in Grand Falls, the government, the province of New Brunswick, had uh, came up with an RFP, and that was our first project in 2011. We installed uh, uh, Grand Falls Hospital and it was for a wood pellet. The uh, RFP was calling for a 10 year contract, which uh, 2013 to 2023. Uh, so we uh, actually uh, own the uh, tender. So we had to build a border room and we maintain and operate the plant for 10 years. We supply heat and domestic hot water to the hospital. Everything is monitored with a BTU meter and invoice monthly. 
That's the 840 Binder Baller. And actually the uh, Binder Baller uh, feature is one of the best. It's, it goes down to 20% of its full capacity, meaning in the summertime, we can use uh, the baller for uh, domestic hot water and other utilities in the hospital. The buffer tank and uh, this picture is 23,000 liters and you see the distribution system. This is a picture of the combustion chamber. And this is the border room at the Grand Falls Hospital with a 50 ton silo on the outside. The Grand Falls Hospital, uh, the winter of 2014-15, the saving was 168,000 liter of oil. The consumption of pellets was 40, 425 tons. We avoid emission of 512 tons of CO2, which represent about $10,000 of uh, CO2 savings. In 2015-2016, we add the supply of the domestic water. So even more savings on the oil, which came up to about 246,500 liters. We consume uh, that year 480 ton of pellets. We avoid emission of 784 ton of CO2 representing about $15,680. I'll give you some more example of different projects in various sectors. This is a building that was built in early 1800s, and it's located at the Mount Allison University in Sackville, New Brunswick. So they were using uh, natural gas as a heating supply, fuel. So we installed a 56 Okofen border with a buffer tank and indirect water heater. CDC Hydraulic was installed in 2014. Hydraulic is a company, they got a warehouse and a store, and we there again, installed 56 kilowatt Okafen border with two buffer tank. And you can see the two buffer tank on the right hand side. Why two buffer tank at this time? Because the warehouse and the store, we assume that we will need more reserve of water. So the border will uh, work more normally, not stop and go. Northwest Potato Farm, which is a farmer that was installed uh, just this year. And uh, he supply making price. So he's also uh, having uh, the heating on the potato uh, barns, but also on the mechanical or maintenance, I should say, building. So we installed two 56 Macy's boilers with two horizontal buffer tank. The uh, 12 ton silo is behind the picture here and it's uh, homemade in the silo. Wesco chicken farm, Forster unit 210 kilowatts replacing direct fire propane heaters. So we spend almost a year with Wesco analyzing the difference between having a heater propane heaters compared to wood pellets. It reduced the moisture, ammonia, improved the chicken health. So uh, really it uh, been good so far. While I'm talking about uh, chicken barn, uh, for your information, Binder has uh, now uh, be able to manufacture a border that can burn chicken shit. So 
or everybody that are interested, you can call me. Greenhouse, Galichon, Quebec, which is close to Temiscaming. It's a thousand uh, megawatt, thousand uh, kilowatt vendor wood chip water. The greenhouse covers 75,000 square feet of greenhouse. And that was installed, uh, if I recall, Twenty eighteen. King Street Elementary, it's a bender three hundred kilowatt in floor heating uh, with two propane backup borders. Actually, a year after we installed it, uh, this system worked so well that uh, even the propane never came on for the first year, even at the peak. So it's been a very good system. That's is working since 2018. The college, uh, New Brunswick, and the University of Moncton in Chipagan, uh, we installed uh, 2019 uh, 840 kilowatt steam wood pellet binder border. This is the installation. You can see the cyclone on the first left hand side, steam drum on the right hand side, and the picture of the front of the border in the middle, the low middle, I should say. Working very well. Fernado, which is uh, close to Quebec City, it's a 500 kilowatt. Fernado, uh, have about uh, 50,000 square feet of greenhouses. And uh, we installed that system uh, in 2020. You can see the border uh, on the left hand side. Uh, some potatoes on the right and the picture of the combustion chamber. This is a project that we just started up last week. Actually, it's a Marbury unit, which 2.5 million BTU, equivalent to about 730 kilowatt. And it's hooked to a malt system. At the left hand side, you see the system. So this farmer, which is a potato farmer, have grain every second year, so he intend to do malt for beers. So you can uh, imagine by the fire on this machine, he needs, uh, the malting unit needs uh, uh, 85 Celsius for about 24 hours. So it's really hot and warm and it's working very well. Hope that it's all. If any question, welcome and thank you. Uh, Theo, thank you so much, merci beaucoup uh, for your presentation. That was fantastic. I, I think it probably would have been quicker for you to go through the list of buildings that you guys aren't providing sustainable heat for. Um, awesome to see kind of, you know, the, the installs going in hospitals, schools, institutional buildings. Uh, very inspiring and great to see that that great work you guys are doing out on the East, uh, East Coast. Um, so we're going to move over now, I think, into our question and answer uh, period for this session. I did see a few uh, questions that came in for both Theo and for Rick uh, while I was uh, taking a look in the background. So if possible, I'm just going to ask my colleague Rob here to pull up uh, our Slido uh, page just so that we can see those questions up on the screen. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Rob. Caught you off guard there a little bit. It's no problem.
Of course, I'm, I'm making things maybe more difficult for you than they need to be, Rob. Appreciate uh, you working with me there. We've got three questions to go through, so I probably could have just uh, read them directly to our speakers, but I appreciate you you posting them up so that everybody can see them uh, all at once. Thanks for that. Um, so it looks like our first uh, question that we've got uh, up at the top is from Romy, uh, and it is directed to Rick. Uh, so Rick, I don't know if you want to maybe take a stab at giving an answer to this question, uh, which was, do your boilers respond to 100% of the heat demand? Uh, and then if you could provide just a little bit of rationale as to why you've gone with boilers versus furnace systems uh, for the installs. Sure, perfect, thank you. Uh, thanks for the question. The uh, the question here, hi Rick, do your boilers respond to 100% of heat demand and why choose a boiler versus a biomass furnace? Um, well, in fact, the, the term boiler actually is uh, misused. It's misrepresented and, and uh, that's across the entire industry because uh, unless you're producing steam, you're actually not boiling water at all. Typically, boilers operate somewhere between the 80 to 90 degree C range, so they're not uh, actually vaporizing whatsoever. Um, and, and just in just the, as the, the mechanics of it, um, the latent heat of vaporization. When you get up to the steam, uh, it's a totally different beast. And these are not boilers actually per se, because we don't uh, produce steam. We produce hot water. They're actually hot water heaters. Um, do the boilers respond to 100% of the heat demand? In in some cases, yes. In uh, in the case of, uh, for instance, the Gixan with Soaten uh, College, um, it is there's peaking boiler uh, peaking boilers there, propane peaking boilers. We have no natural gas access up north there, uh, so they're propane and they will take care of the peak demands at uh, those very cold. We hit minus 38 uh, degrees this year and uh, for thank thankfully only a brief period of time. So hopefully that answers your question. Uh, Rick, did you deliberately choose standard equipment with the same equipment supplier for ease of maintenance, spare parts, or was it that they were local? Um, we we stick with uh, various different servicing equipment, uh, such as uh, like a Grundfos pumps, for instance. We, um, from a maintenance perspective, using 220 pumps instead of 110 volt pumps uh, does reduce the amount of maintenance and increases the longevity of your, your pump life. Uh, and thus makes it easier long term for serviceability. We we chose uh, the standard. We we actually uh, utilize the same tank supplier. We utilize the same uh, pressure relief uh, suppliers, and and uh, we deal with uh, Canada wide um, supply people and and supply uh, uh, companies that will be able to service what they sell literally and uh, and not use uh, different parts that are only available on special order. We try to stick with the, uh, the, the standards. Thank you. Great, thanks so much Rick for uh, giving some responses to those questions and thanks uh, to our audience for submitting them to Rick. Uh, great to be able to facilitate that knowledge transfer and kind of start some conversations between folks through the series. Uh, and it looks like our, our last uh, question here from Romy again isn't uh, necessarily a question, but some kudos uh, to share with Theo uh, on uh, the fact that uh, she really enjoyed your presentation. Uh, so thanks so much for the details that you gave in, in your deck there. Great to see the quantification of your savings, uh, both uh, financial and carbon as a result of, of, of those installs. So yeah, thanks, thanks for that. Okay, so I mean, at this point, uh, we, we've we hit the end of our questions. You guys have been pretty quiet today. Um, so I would invite you, if you have any last minute ones, maybe type them out into the chat box right away here. We've got about four more minutes left in our scheduled time for this session today. Uh, so perhaps if you know no, no additional questions are coming in, we'll be safe to wrap up a little bit early. Um, I will uh, share my screen here again uh, and provide just some final comments. Let's see if I can pull that up. And I can. Okay, great. So uh, once again, thanks so much uh, to Rick, to John, and to Theo for joining. Um, thanks as well to our virtual audience uh, out watching the session today. I hope you enjoyed learning a little bit about uh, BioHeat success stories from outside of Ontario. Uh, and you're inspired and ready to make uh, some bioheat installs happen in your own community. 
Um, I'd like to also uh, just give a note of thanks to our technical host, Rob. Uh, he was the guy who was helping with the Slido questions a little earlier. Really appreciate all of the support you've given us to make the, the sessions go well and make sure everything has been operating smoothly throughout the series. Uh, it's been my personal pleasure uh, to moderate uh, our bio, Solid Wood Bioheat webinar series. Uh, I hope you've learned from our speakers as much as I have. Uh, it's been a lot of fun kind of chatting with everybody, hearing um, uh, from folks who are interested in bioheat right across Ontario and right across Canada. Uh, if you have any questions or comments about this series that you'd like to pass along, please reach out using the contact information provided uh, in this slide. You can see my email address is there. You've also, of course, been receiving quite a few emails from me just as a result of the registration uh, for this session. Um, so I'll be following up with everybody who registered um, a little bit later this afternoon with a final feedback survey. Uh, if you'd like to share some opinions, comments or ideas that way, really uh, value anything that you have to, to offer about the webinar series. Uh, and I'm hoping as well to upload the remaining uh, session recordings to YouTube really soon. Um, that way you can go uh, and take a look back at a session if you missed uh, one of the webinars or you missed part of them, you want to uh, catch up on maybe something that popped up. Um, I'll make sure to send out a notice once those recordings uh, are available. So keep an eye out for that. Uh, and I guess on behalf of our webinar organizing committee, uh, thanks again for tuning into the series. I hope that you gained a little bit of insight into the world of heating with solid woody biofuels uh, and the benefits that it can bring uh, to different uh, heat users. So with that, uh, I'll be signing off. All the best to all of you uh, and stay safe. Thanks so much for joining. Bye-bye.